Well, Charlie Brown has this comic strip where he's talking to Snoopy. And he says, Snoopy, we only live once. And Snoopy said, nope, we only die once. We live every day. So today in the scripture, God is telling us that we are going to live every day from now on to eternity. And we die, but we die just once. And then we live every day in Christ. So today we're talking about the death of death. Last week I forgot to start with a funny joke. Well, you guys may say that every week I forget to have a funny joke. But this couple found a home that they really liked. And so they were very excited. And they told the real estate agent, if the owners will just renovate the kitchen, add a deck, install a pool, replace the roof, expand the living room, and move the house to the other side of the town, we are very interested. That's why I love those home improvement shows. They have them on HGTV. A person will come in and they'll say... I don't like this room or that room. Then five minutes later, they got the sledgehammers out. They're knocking down walls. And seven weeks later, they come back home, and the property brothers have everything done, completely beautiful. I want you to know that that's what Isaiah is saying God is doing with us. Over the last five months, we've been trudging through Isaiah, right? And they refer to it a couple of times here about how God's going to straighten things out and flatten people down and... It's been hard because it's been real. God's word is simultaneously the only thing that has the power and the right to judge us because it's the only thing that has the power to forgive us and to save us. The fact that the owner of the house is willing to do all these renovations himself on us, on the whole world he made, whether we like it or not, shows how much he cares about us And how much he cares about the house that we're going to live in forever. Isaiah often, as today, points out that it's our sin and our pride. And he says the consequences of our choices are not avoidable. That God's going to remove and reduce things. He's going to upend and flip over. And that he's just going to leave a few seeds and stumps and then try again to grow. This nature of God's justice mixed with mercy and hope. I think is hardwired into the circuitry of the whole universe. The world life that God created when the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the deep dark chaos. And then he spoke, let there be light. And then with God's own two hands, he made us and he breathed his own breath into us. But you and I know that no house stays clean. Especially if you have a new puppy. Or kids. There's no new car smell that'll last before you start getting your first dink at Walmart and your first dent and scratch. Nothing remains good. And then eventually, death appears in our life, a life that started with such cute, cuddly hope when we were babies. Someone said earlier at breakfast, we were talking about scars that we have, and they said the scars are the signs that we're still alive. At our age, scars are... I know that we used to have that Robert Schuller preacher on the West Coast, Crystal Cathedral, remember him? He used to say, you have to let God turn your scars into stars, right? I went out to the Crystal Cathedral because that was a favorite of a grandmother of a friend of mine. And that building is not big. The camera, the way they angle it, makes it look huge. This church is, I'd say, not quite smaller than the Crystal Cathedral. It was, it was shocking to me what a little camera work can do. <coughs> The reason we sin is that we're always trying to fix problems ourselves without the hands that made us in the first place, without letting the Holy Spirit hover over the surface of our deep, darkest secrets because we don't let Jesus speak God's powerful, miraculous, creative words, His commands into our lives. His commands are amazing. They simultaneously give us permission And show us the possibility in our life. They're basically saying, you're better than this. I made you to be better than this. And we respond, nope, we're just dust. We're just little dust bunnies under the cosmic couch, you know. And God says, I know you are, but I made you to be more. Where there is darkness, disorganization, and degeneration, God says, let there be light and let there be life. And he calls us good. This is what it means. And and so much more. When God says, I created them male and female in my own image. 
We are born into a world that is constantly pulled down by nature's gravity. Back into that empty void that Isaiah refers to when he says that we will be brought down to the ground and to the very dust from which we came. The cosmos we live in is constantly trying to return to that original deep, dark chaos, that cold death that starts Genesis 1. And the original sin embedded in us is also pulling us back constantly. We're like water that just flows downhill. We are ruled in this life by something called the three laws of thermodynamics. Do we have any scientists here? You know, every other week I bring out some science, and who knows if I'm even close. But the first says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. And yet, God violated that on the very first day of creation, where He supernaturally changed nothing into something. But then He also takes those laws of nature and He says, Okay, I don't have to create every day, but I'm going to transform you every day. Every day you wake up, I'm going to give you new mercies. I'm going to speak new possibilities to you. You're going to have new hope today. Yeah, yesterday was bad or yesterday was good, but tomorrow can even be better. Jesus Christ is renovating the home we live in. And sometimes he even gets a broom and does a little sweeping and cleaning up. And then he violates sometimes this second and third law of thermal... You know... All I know about the law of thermodynamics is this one. It says entropy. You've ever heard that word, entropy? It basically means if something can fall apart, it will fall apart. If we can get old, we will get old. If we can start hurting, we will hurting. If something could rust, it will rust. We are constantly pulled by ourself, our systems, our surroundings, back into what we call sin. We, there's an old term in the Bible that says we aim at something and we miss. And that's translated sin. We have these deep hidden hurts that have turned somehow bitter and black like a bruise under our skin or like a cancer spreading through our soul. And the Bible calls these iniquities, deep hidden sins. And like Adam and Eve, we go where we shouldn't go and we do what we shouldn't do and we call those transgressions. And then we also also fail to repay the love and kindness God has given us. We're stingy that way. We're fine if somebody forgives and forgets the bad things we do, but heaven help us if we forgive and forget the things they do. And so that's why we pray here in church, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who owe us. And all of this sin, this pull, is nature's entropy that leads to the third law that says there will eventually be a constant, cold, absolute, zero silence of nothing, death. That's the universe's vision. When people talk to me about the universe, they say, well, the uni-, they mean God, but they're afraid to say God. And that upsets me so much because the universe has one plan for you. It's for that clock to wind down and stop. And that's not God's vision. Never has been from Genesis 1. Someone asked me about that sin part of the Lord's Prayer. They said, why do some churches say sin? And some say, forgive us our debts. And some say, forgive us our trespasses. The Word of God is so powerfully explosive that one little word in the Bible often means several different things. And in this case, that word in the Lord's Prayer means all those types of sins that I elaborated on. Packed in that one little word. But today, Isaiah finally stops his 25 chapters prophesying about our failures. And God starts to talk about what He's going to do to fix it. And He says He's going to start inside of us Limited creatures, destined to die, made of weak dust. He's going to remove the laws of decay. Totally. And instead, listen to this, instead of speaking into that deep, dark chaos, instead of just breathing His life into you and to me, He said He's just going to give up and swallow death completely and have us all inside of Him. Praise God. That's, that's why this chapter starts out praising God. I don't know what it would have sounded like if you and I were in church back 3,000 years ago when Isaiah was preaching this and we had to listen to 24 chapters of him telling everybody in all of our countries and us how we've done all these things wrong and then finally, hallelujah, he tells us, but I realize you guys can't fix it, so I'm going to fix it. And so of course you would start out by saying, the Lord Almighty will reign with great glory. Lord, you are my God. I'll lift you up and praise your name. 
For in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, and you planned all of this long ago. You know, people say, especially this time of year, that there's only two things you can't escape, which are what? Death and taxes. But that's not true. We are going to escape death and taxes. We can even escape the charges and accusations that people bring against us today, the Bible said, to try to shame us and make us feel like we're just not good enough. In Romans 8, Paul says it this way, Who can bring a charge against someone that God has chosen? Because it's God who justifies. So who can condemn? No one. Christ Jesus died, and more than that, was raised to life. And now He's at the right hand of God praying for us. And so who shall ever separate us from Jesus' love? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. We face death all day long. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present or future, not powers or deep depths or height, or anything in all of creation will ever separate us from the love of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. I've really taken lately to read large passages of of Scripture. I've noticed that. I I just love God's Word. In the Princess Bride movie, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, Wesley gets back from being gone for years and he asks Buttercup, why did you ever agree to marry the prince? You knew I was coming back to marry you. And she said, well, you were dead. And Wesley says, death can't stop true love. And that's what God is saying to us today. So in your bulletin, I listed four little notes in the sermon section There are four things that God says he'll do, but really it's two things. And really it's just one thing. Because the ancient writers didn't have bold font. They couldn't underline, right? Ty, they didn't have special, you know, you just, they barely had capitalization, spaces, or punctuation. I don't think that you had vowels most of the time. If you read Hebrew, it often doesn't even have the vowel dots on it. It's just a bunch of consonants running together. You figure out what that means. So the way Scripture often has to emphasize the importance of an idea and make it stand out is it sounds so nice, they say it twice. And here God says twice, poetically and prophetically, that He is swallowing up death. He emphasizes that what that means is not just one big death day, but those little millions of little deaths that you and I suffer every day. Those little cuts that take away our joy in our laughter, in our life. You know, when they asked Jesus, why did you come here? You know he said two things, right? He said, I came that you should have life and have it abundantly. And I came that you should have my joy and your joy should be complete. And when these little, what I call little D deaths every day, take away our life and joy, that's not from God. So let's look at this word. First he says shroud. He's going to take away the shroud. In Hebrew, that is a word called pene, which doesn't mean anything, but it's used 2,000 times in the Bible. And here's the thing about pene, shroud. It's translated 99 different ways. Plus a whole bunch of variations. You know, like every time I have a student in my class that's spelled, that's Megan or something like that, you don't know how it's spelled. It could be spelled 50 different ways. But 99 different translations of that one word, plus variations on a lot of those. The first time it occurs, pene, shroud, is when the Bible says that God's Holy Spirit moved over the shroud of the deep, the face of the deep, the surface of the deep. And then later on it says that we will all stand before the face of God. So it really means face. But it's also used to mean your battle, your anger, your beseeching, your bargaining, your countenance and your acceptance and your purpose. And I don't know if those six words I just said rang familiar to you, but when I read what that word meant, and I read battle, anger, bargain, countenance, acceptance, and purpose, it reminded me when people talk about death, they say there are five or six stages of grief where you have anger, denial, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And finally, you're able to go out and serve other people who have suffered. Somehow in this little word that he starts out with, when you, as they say, unfolds that word, 
It means all these ways that we deal with loss and with death. So here it's translated, shroud that enfolds the people. And we know immediately he's talking about when we die or when we suffer. Why do we wrap people in fancy suits or coffins? Or in the old days they used to wrap them with cloth or shrouds when they die? I think there's part of all of us that wrap those with love because we're wrapping them almost like a present. Like we're expecting something in the unknown, a package wrapped to be delivered for the life to come. You know, the ancient Egyptians used to wrap them carefully, layer after layer. Apparently they were like Chicago winters in Egypt, I don't know. But under every layer they put a special amulet of protection to protect them where they were going. But here God is saying we don't need those protections. Despite our best continuous efforts, he's just going to go ahead and solve the whole problem of sin and death for us. Then the prophecy repeats this promise to emphasize it. And he says, God will destroy the sheet that covers all the nations and swallow up death forever. And here sheet is more like a, a veil. Have you ever seen a veil over a bride? She'll wear that sheet. Um, I went to Transylvania. It's part of Romania. Where, you know, Count Dracula, I want to talk. So I... I, was, I have this book on rituals around the world. And I said, well, I'm going to look in that book for death. And I saw Transylvania, Romania. So I contacted one of my good friends over there. And I said, is this true? He said, oh, yeah, this, this actually happens. If you're a young lady or a young man, but mainly the young ladies, and you haven't been married yet and you unfortunately pass away, your family will bury you in a wedding dress at the funeral. One author who observed this story said, I've never seen such a beautiful bride. The priest comes to the house and crowns you lying on the table. You are a bride in a coffin, but the groom is with God. The groom is the son of the king, and he will lead you by his hand to heaven. So Isaiah picks up this thread later. He's like a master. I don't know if you've ever studied, uh, what do you call them, symphonies or Beethoven, all them. They'll, they'll have a little melody, and I'm not smart enough to follow it all, but they'll have a small melody, and they'll introduce it. Dun, 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 like. But then later on, they get all these melodies going together, and they elaborate it. That's what Isaiah does. He is, he's a master of ideas. Here's a little Jesus, just a glimpse. And then chapter 41, we get these huge sections which describe Jesus in such detail that no modern person cannot know that he's talking about Jesus Christ. And so Isaiah starts to weave this idea that God is somehow going to clothe us and shroud us and wrap us and veil us for something special, even though we're facing the worst possible death. Isaiah 61 says, God will provide for everyone who is grieving. He will bestow on them a crown of beauty for their ashes. He will give them oil of joy instead of mourning. He will give them garments of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And they will be called the strong oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his splendor. But in the face of death, we often try to envision our own splendor. You know, there's a lot of computer geeks out there. I was listening to some, I've been listening to these long talks on the internet where people talk for two or three hours. You learn so much. And they were talking about, do you think computers will ever get smart enough where we can upload our consciousness into a computer? You know, that's a lot of people's dream, right? There's, that's our vision. We, done, we did really good with the Abacus. We learned how to count. Then we figured out to add a zero. And we, you know, we were really, really smart monkeys. And then I watched a documentary recently on how we invented the computer. And I, that is pretty smart, how they figured out how to do those counting machines with just little grinders and basically complicated clocks. But now we think technology has gone so far, so fast, that maybe it's our salvation. It can take us all the way. Who needs eternal life from God when we can just upload ourselves into a computer and there we are? And one of this philosophers, psychologist, was on there. He said, well, these people just don't know what they're talking about. Because life is more than what you and I think or remember. Life is about the interactions we have with other people. We're connected. And I know that as a Christian because... In Genesis 1, you have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the Father creating us. And God says, I created these people in my image to be united, to have a relationship. The only one that we can get that glorious technology from 
is the one who originally made us. And how does God plan to do that? We said last week that we will know as we are known. Can you imagine that? You will know everything about yourself and everything about others as much as God knows about you. We focus on the living forever part of life, but there's a lot more to eternal life than that. Unfortunately, there's this view sometimes that we still think we can be good enough and earn our way, be smart enough and figure out a way to get to heaven or to live forever. And Jesus, you know, he tries to be very blunt and very clear. And one time he just looked at people and he said, there's going to be a lot of people who come to me. And they say, Lord, Lord, look at all the good things we did. And he's going to say, get away. I never knew you. Because ultimately, it's about a relationship that you and I have. One time Jesus said, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. Have you ever heard that? And anyone who opens the door, I will come in. He's talking about coming into your heart. Anyone who opens the door, I'll come into them and I'll be with you. And you'll be with me. He wasn't talking about non-Christians. He wrote that letter to a church. He's just reminding us, and we all need to hear this, that God wants a personal relationship and He wants to live in your life, in your heart. So then there's a second. That's the big D, death. Then there's the second little D, death, that He does. It's the three and four I have in the book there, in the bulletin. And these little D deaths consume most of our life. Most of it don't work. How many of you think about death every day? I seriously doubt a lot of people do. But we think about small things that people have done to offend us or hurt us or things, disappointments we've had. The Bible says the sovereign Lord will then wipe away every tear from all the faces and remove from his people all of their disgraces. I switched around and make it rhyme. I thought that sounded a little bit better. Tears from faces and remove all disgraces. You know, I think people nowadays are a lot stronger than just the fear of death. Or maybe we don't think about it because it's not our biggest problem anymore. You know, the dinosaurs aren't going to step on us. The tigers aren't going to eat us. We have other problems. Does our cable work? Is the electricity going to go out so I can charge my iPhone? How am I going to microwave, you know, my popcorn? But we are wired to use death as a tool. You know, Cain killed Abel because he was jealous. Death has come what they call in the news the nuclear option. Have you ever heard that? Jesus said to us, don't kid yourself. You may not go around murdering people, but every time you and I have a negative thought about someone or we say, that person is just a complete moron. And we say it all the time. If we don't say it out loud, we might say it in here. And he says, what you just did is a little murder. You killed a little bit of yourself, and you, killed, you would have killed them if you could have gotten away with it. His brother, James, said, Why do you have so much fighting? Because you, you want something, and you can't have it, so you go out and you kill. You want it, and you can't get it, so you quarrel and you fight. But you don't have, because you don't ask God, who gives you everything. The reason we have never stopped using death as a tool is because in evolution, the way we, you know, things change and come about, death is the response to everything that it disagrees with. How does evolution decide who lives and who dies, what wins and what loses? Because everything that doesn't win gets killed off. And somehow that's programmed into the world. This death and decay, this inter is part of the very fabric of being on this fallen planet. The problem is that that does not understand the word of God, that we can't fix a problem by fixing someone else because God says the problems always start inside of us. And that's why Jesus, when he says, you want me to solve eternity and give you salvation? Let me come into your heart because that's where everything begins. A lot of people say, I got to go on a vacation to get away from all these crazy people. But what they don't understand is that they take themselves with them on vacation. I wouldn't look at you, Gary, for any particular reason. I'll just happen to glance over that way. So today we are shielded from death, and that's wonderful. It's a safe, sanitized world. Sometimes I wonder if it's too safe. You know, when I was a kid, I don't remember being in the house in the summertime. I don't remember, I don't remember wearing shoes. We'd be in the forest, in the woods. We'd be getting into all... We'd ride our bikes around. Now kids can't ride their bikes all around town all day, and they can't even ride their bike, period, unless they wear half a bowling ball on top of their head. But, you know, we're safer. 
But modern people do encounter a lot of shades and nightmares, whether it's a pathological experience or even demonic. We still fear fear itself. And we don't know how to deal with suffering except to blame someone else or to take a pill. But the only antidote to our suffering, and there is a lot of evil and unfairness in the world, and we do suffer. He wipes the tears away for a reason. He removes the disgrace for a reason. But the only true antidote is to find meaning in life, and there's no greater meaning than to find God. We feel pain from all kinds of different sources, reproach and shame. Others attack us from the outside. The Hebrew word, you know, I'm on a tear here of, of Hebrew words today. So, you know, next week's sermon will be different, but this is how I, it spoke to me today. They're so packed. The Hebrew word for shame here refers to so many things. It refers to hunger, sexual disgrace, widowhood, childlessness, or some sort of ritual impurity where people just know you're not, you're not one of them. You're not good enough. And then mainly it refers to anything that an enemy attacks you on trying to injure you. Something that someone rebukes us for, they said you did wrong, and God says, well, I'm going to make it right. So we need some practical steps to do this. And what I have found is that we are our own worst enemy. How many of you have ever had a really bad day where someone has, somewhere someone has done something bad to you? Nobody. No. Sally hasn't. Sally's in it. Sally, you know, if you don't raise your hand that you've had something done wrong to you, that probably means you're the one out there doing the wrong. But, you know, I'm not going to say that until Sally makes all those brownings that she's going to do. The problem I've always found with that philosophy is, is I know it hurts. I've had hurts before. And I know we want to get it off our chest. But there's a point where getting it off your chest becomes a festering wound. And we get this tape recorder of something my mama said to me, something my daddy said to me, something my husband or wife said to me. I don't know how that's possible because basically the only thing I remember from conversations with my ex-wife was um, she would start out really weird. She would say, you're not even listening to me. That's a very odd way to start a conversation with somebody. You see, said, no, I listen, because I was clearly not listening. So. What we have to do is we have to change the tape in our head and change the tape in our mouth. Why? Because they're often the most tragic, hurtful things. Why in the world would we want to relive them all the time? Joel Osteen, very positive, upbeat pastor, he said, you simply won't have the strength to keep moving forward if you're always weeping about what you've left behind. He said it takes a lot of energy to relive hurts. Um, in the military, when we train chaplains to be counselors, we do a lot of counseling, and we don't have a lot of time to hold your hand, right? We don't have six weeks of therapy. We can't bring you back. we got to wrap you up mentally and get you back on there so you don't hurt yourself or others. You can do your job. So we do a lot of short-term solution. So we show this video of Bob Newhart. Do you remember Bob Newhart? One of the funniest guys ever. He's a Chicago guy, boy, wasn't he? So he's a counselor, and this guy comes in. He says, uh, what seems to be your problem? Well, he, he goes into his problem. He says, well, I can, I can either have you come in week after week, month after month for years, or I can just you know, fix your problem for $5 right now. And he says, well, let's do the short version. He said, he said okay. He um, said, all that stuff you're doing? Stop it! <laughs> he said... But I'm going to say, stop it! <laughs> and so he just finally throws the Kleenex box. He just keeps yelling, stop it! <laughs> Cicero is my favorite politician philosopher. He said we can't just stop stuff. He said everybody knows we have bad habits that are this tape replaying. He said what you have to do is you have to replace the tape. You know, humans read the book of Revelation and they make movies about the end of the world, Right? Things exploding, people dying, death on horses, all that stuff. But have you ever read that book, and I say it over and over again, you look what's going on in heaven, they're celebrating. They're praising God. That is the secret of how to deal with suffering. Instead of repeating the things that went wrong, we repeat the things that God has done good. This is the Lord, we say today. We trusted in Him. Let's rejoice and be glad because He will save us. And this actually works. We have to start speaking like God speaks. We have to look at the deepest, darkest, blackest, most chaotic, disorganized, ridiculous, nothing void, and say, let there be light. 
What if God walked into the universe before creation? He said, man, this is a dark, dank, ugly place. There's nothing I can do with this place. He didn't. And we can't either. We have to speak the power of his words. Isaiah 63 is one of the, my favorite all time. I said to you that he'll give you beauty for ashes. I say that all the time. He'll give me beauty for ashes. He'll give me the oil of gladness in the place of my mourning. He'll give me garments of praise. Why do I say that? Because if I'm saying one thing, I can't say the other. If I'm saying he's going to fix it and he's going to help me, I can't say how bad that person broke it and how bad they hurt it. You can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And before long, you know, I told this story a long time ago, but I'll tell it again. The old grandfather had his, his little boy, his grandson, Indian, grand, Native American, and the grandpa said, son, he'd done something wrong. He got in trouble. And the little boy, you know, he knew he'd done wrong, but you can't resist doing wrong, right? You met people you had to arrest all the time. That They knew what they did was wrong. They probably regretted it the moment it happened, but, you know, in for a penny. And the grandson says, why do I do that? He says, well, son, inside of you, you have two wolves fighting. You have a good wolf and you have a bad wolf. And we all got them. And the little boy said, well, which one's going to win? And he said, the one that you feed the most. You have things in your life that seem dead. Maybe your relationship or finances, maybe your health, maybe someone you love is hurting. Jesus would tell you today that he has the power over death, that God's love can bring that relationship back to a new life. Maybe not the old version, but something that seems dead to you, he can take and recreate. I want to encourage you today that that same power that raised Jesus, that same power that Isaiah promised, that God is swallowing up not just the big death, but every single little nick and scratch small death, that God came to resurrect what you feel is dead. And problems that looked permanent will suddenly turn around and you'll see that God hasn't changed his mind. He still is saying, let there be light. Would you please rise and join with me in singing our closing hymn? I want to walk as a child of the light. Number 248. <laughs>